Good morning, class. Happy Friday. It's Friday. Um, today, in ELA, we're going to learn about voting. Does anybody know what voting is? Yes. Yeah, we vote for our president. Yes. We have elections this year, so that's a pretty big deal. Okay, well, we're going to watch a little video about voting. So I would like you to put all of your things away and put your attention up here to the board, okay? is our ability to pick a government that represents the broadest range of americans what should change or stay the same you vote your voice if you don't vote you choose silence to be eligible here's what's required 18 year old a u.s citizen the resident of the state Wait. what did we think about that video yes okay um, so now we're going to read a short story about how important it is to vote, okay? I want you to get out your iPads and log into Hoopla, and we are going to read the story, A Vote is a Powerful Thing, by Catherine Steer. Okay, you guys logged in? Okay, I want you to follow along. If you struggle to follow along on the iPad, it'll be up here on the board also. A vote is a powerful thing. A vote is a powerful thing. That's what my teacher says. Powerful enough to change the world. That gets my attention, so I listen up. One vote combined with other votes during an election is what puts our mayors, governors, senators, and even the president of the United States into office, Ms. Trask explains. Right now, that's what everyone's talking about, the presidential election in November. But Ms. Trask says we'll soon have our very own classroom election too. It's for something I think you'll all care about, Ms. Trask hints. Elections can be about important issues as well. A vote, we find out in class, really is a powerful thing. So powerful that throughout our country's history, people organized, marched, and protested for the right to vote. We have votes for women, Voting Rights Acts 1965, Support the 18-Year-Old Vote, Native Vets Stand Up, Native American Vote, Access is a Right, Equal Access to the Polls. My grandma knows a vote is a powerful thing too, powerful enough that she's up early this Saturday 
Please vote for funds to save the wilderness park, Grandma tells every, every grown-up she meets. Being outside in the forest is good for you. And where else in this town can folks experience the wonders of nature? People don't know much about the wilderness park. I do. It's where I saw my first mountain, laurel and full bloom, my first turtle in a pond, my first swallowed butterfly. It's where I spotted my first great horned owl. Those are some interesting animals that we have. I want to save the park too but I don't know how to help. At school, we talk more about voting. We learn that supporters of a candidate or a cause may spend lots of time and money on campaigns with signs, ads, and speeches. They do this in hopes of winning each citizen's one precious, powerful vote. That day, Miss Trask makes her big announcement. Our classroom elections will be for our next field trip. You may choose between the cookie factory or the wilderness park. Ooh, that would be a hard choice. The cookie factory tour gives free samples. Yum, says Lynn. That would be good. I heard there's a nature trail at the park, says Reed. What's so special about that? asks Jenny. Suddenly, I know this election is important to me and I have an idea. Some of my classmates have never been to the wilderness park. If they saw it just once, I know they'd want to visit again and bring their families. Then maybe lots of people would care about saving the park. Miss Trask, I say, I'd like to campaign in support of the wilderness park. An inspiring idea, Callie, she says. So first, I design posters. I draw postcards, I write a speech. It isn't easy. Maybe you could share your best memories of the park, Callie, Dad suggests. On our class's election day, Lynn makes her, first, her speech first. She's read all about the cookie factory. She tells everyone we could learn important things on the tour about food and science and technology. She isn't wrong. The cookie factory would be a good field trip. And don't forget, free cookies, Lynn says. Then it's my turn. First, I tell everyone about my best wilderness park memories. The woodsy forest smells, the cardinals singing in the trees, and the tadpoles with long tails and brand new legs wriggling around the pond. And that awesome owl. And like Lynn, I've done my research too. Scientists believe that spending time in nature can help kids be healthier and smarter and more creative, I say, and even kinder too. Really, Jenny asks? Uh-huh, but we can all find out for ourselves. I say, vote for the wilderness park. Everyone in class receives a paper ballot. One by one, we cast our votes. I hold my breath as Miss Trask counts them up. She pulls the last ballot from the box and holds it up. I am proud of Lynn and Callie, says Miss Trask. You both ran great campaigns and made some excellent points about each field trip. So excellent, in fact, that the election is tied now with just one vote left to count. Miss Trask unfolds the last ballot and smiles. And the winner is, ooh, what do you think? What do you think it's gonna be? The Wilderness Park. How exciting.
At the wilderness park, Reed scrambles up a rock. Diego sniffs a wildflower. Jenny examines a spider's web through a magnifying glass. And then we all spot it. A quick flash of red as a fox darts from a bush and dashes across the path. I've never seen a fox before. That's amazing, Lynn whispers. I wish my brother could see all of this. And my mom, says Reed, I'm full of hope. Vote yes to save Wilderness Park. Vote yes on number 24. Vote today, because now I know it's really true. A vote is a powerful thing. Okay, how did we feel about that book? We learned how important it is to vote. Even if it is just for something so small, like saving the wilderness park, it's important. Every vote counts, every single vote. If one student had not voted, there would have been a tie and they would have had to, I don't know what they would have done. They would have had to re-vote or the teachers would have had to choose. So then it would have been pointless to even do the vote. So we are going to read another book about women's rights when it comes to voting. So I want you guys to take out your daily log binders. We're going to write there on your first page, we're going to write vote, women's fight for access to the ballot box by Coral Celeste Frazier. Then you're going to write chapters 1 through 3, 10-16-20, chapters 4 through 6, 10-19-20 and chapter 7 through 9, 10-20-20. Okay, so we're starting chapters 1 through 3. We're starting the book today and we are going to finish it next Tuesday. Okay, so I want you to know that on the next page, Right now, I want you to do this. You're going to write your personal definition of the word vote. Then you are going to look up the dictionary definition of the word vote. And then we're going to write a summary of chapters one through three after we're done reading and give our thoughts, our opinions, and any questions that we may have. Okay, so I want you to get that written down in your book. Okay, everyone's ready. Okay, awesome. Vote, Women's Fight for Access to the Ballot Box by Coral Celeste Frazier. On a sunny spring day in March 1913, more than 5,000 women lined up to march down Pennsylvania Avenue, a famed street in Washington, D.C that connects the White House and the U.S. Capitol. Dressed in matching capes and caps, color-coded by profession or by state, the women were ready to show the nation that they wanted the right to vote. Some rode in cars, while most walked. Their ranks included nine marching bands, three trumpeteers, 2,000 yellow banners, 24 historically themed floats, six golden chariots, and four groups on horseback. Oh, there's a picture. These are costume dancers, including a performer dressed as Columbia, a symbol of the United States. They present a dance in front of the U.S. Treasury Building, and the dancers participated in this 1913 parade in the nation's capital to promote women's suffrage. As the parade sets off, 100 dancers in filmy white dresses began a ballot on the marble steps of the Treasury Building, where the parade would end. The climax, climax of their performance was set to coincide with the arrival of the first marchers. 
So 45 minutes after the parade began, women in costumes representing the qualities of liberty, justice, charity, hope, and peace swept down the marble steps and joined a woman dressed as Columbia, a goddess-like figure representing the United States. Together, the performers waited to greet the marchers. But the marchers did not arrive as expected. Though their waiting supporters did not know it, they were fighting their way through masses of unruly spectators who had slipped past police barriers to block their route. Every step forward was a battle. Even when women in the parade drove cars slowly to part the crowd, loud, aggressive male protesters poured in to fill the gaps. Many of the men were drunk. They hurled abuse at the marching women. Good morning, class. So, Friday, we started a book called, quote, Women's Fight for Access to the Ballot Box. And we finished it yesterday, and we were able to discuss it, and then pull out our, our reading logs um, with the summaries of the chapters, thoughts, questions, things like that. So now that we have done all of that, and we understand how important voting is and how far we've come when it comes to voting and voting rights, I want you to, um, we're gonna, you're gonna choose a person that made an impact on voting and the voting rights that we have today. So it could be a woman, a man, anybody, um, African American, anybody that made a difference in what voting is today. So we are going to make what we call a history board. So I've given you all a piece of paper on your desk. You're going to get your rulers out, and you are going to measure one inch in, and you're going to draw a border here, just like this, okay? This is going to be your border. In your border, you are going to draw pictures that, something that represents this person. Maybe um, a piece of corn or like something that you can kind of repetitively draw around the border um, to look um, like a bulletin board border kind of that represents your person that you have chose. What I want you to put inside of here, you're going to put one picture of the person. You can either draw them or you can print one um, from the internet. Um, you're going to do the birth date and the date of their death if they have passed already. Their name should be up here at the top. Um, their spouse name if they were married, who they were married to. Um, and if they have any children. Any children um, that they may have had, you want to list those on there. All of this needs to be on here. And then we're going to write seven facts about the person. And the facts, these are not included. We want seven facts about this person. Seven things this person did in their life that were related to voting. Okay? seven things. So we're going to work on this today and probably um, finish it up tomorrow. I want you to make sure it is colorful, it has detail, and it's organized. Okay, and I put a rubric in your Google Classroom, your ELA, under the ELA topic, um, there's a rubric for you to go off of with all of this information. Okay? Gonna have this 
all of this information in there. It's going to um, have the rubric of what I want. I want the you know, colorful, organized. Does it have everything here that I want, you to, want it to have? Is it neat? Is it creative? Like anything like that. Okay, so that's going to be on your rubric. So you can access that in your Google Classroom. Okay, let's get started.